Sydney, post-World War II. A city still living in the shadows of the past. A deadly crime wave sweeps through the inner suburbs. Over 100 people are poisoned. And the shocking truth is that most of the killers are women. Three are notorious. Yvonne Fletcher, a blonde seductress with an attraction to bad men. She was on the road to hell, one way or another. Caroline Grills, a jolly grandmother with a deadly secret. It was such an insidious thing that she did to her own relatives, to her own friends. Veronica Monti, a woman on the edge, embroiled in a sex scandal. This was an attempted murder, very, very serious crime. You know, saturation coverage in the press. What is it about this city that turns women into cold-blooded killers? Read all about it. April 1952. Two Sydney detectives commence a murder investigation. They have no idea how big the case will become or how many people will die. It all begins with the suspicious deaths of two men. They both have one thing in common. They were married to Yvonne Fletcher. The investigation goes back five years. Yvonne is 25, with two small children. But she's no ordinary housewife. Yvonne Fletcher looked a little bit like a Hollywood starlet. She had the platinum blonde hair beautifully set. She had her makeup beautifully done. She liked to wear nice dresses and go out and dance and just have a gay time. Yvonne Fletcher might look glamorous, but she lives in the slums of Newtown, where the neighbours notice she doesn't really fit in. She never ever was talking to anyone else in the street where, where I lived, nearly every neighbour next door to you, you'd always see them talking and something, but not Yvonne. Life in Newtown is nothing like what Yvonne sees in the glossy magazines. People think of the late 40s and 1950s as a period of, you know, like happy days and laminex and new consumer goods, modern new houses, cars and so on. But in fact, it, it didn't play that way in Sydney. Housing was in a very poor state in Sydney by the late 40s. There were also shortages of fresh food, electricity, and it was a fairly austere time. People were renting houses that were in bad shape. They couldn't even buy bits of tin to fix them up. They had to deal with things like rats. You read stories from that period where husbands and wives had to sleep with their children in between them to stop the rats biting the children during the night. Really desperately dirty and horrible circumstances. To make things worse, Yvonne's husband, Desmond Butler, is a heavy drinker. He spends most of his time at the local pub. Pubs were noisy, roaring places, high, with high spirits, but with a kind of mad energy to it, a desperate sort of mad energy. The hotels had to close at six o'clock. The drinkers had to get in there as soon as they could after work and their main object was to consume as much alcohol in that period as they could. And when Desmond Butler drinks, he gets jealous. He accuses Yvonne of sleeping around. So there was a lot of jealousy and accusations within the house. 
she got to the stage where she'd been telling her friends that, you know, she'd had enough of him and he wouldn't give her a fair go and that she was really unhappy in the relationship. The social taboos of the time make it difficult for her to leave that marriage. There was a very compelling and strong, powerful, powerful view in society of that day that um, once you're married, you would remain married. One night, after a huge argument, Yvonne Fletcher takes her revenge. And Desmond Butler starts to get sick. All I remember was Des when I used to see him. He was very frail and he just used to sort of uh, walk very slow. But I used to see Yvonne a lot. She looked well, but, but Des was so thin, you know, that, that was, uh, everyone knew something was going on. She put around the idea that he was just a bit of a hypochondriac and, a, and uh, not much chop in any way. After a long illness, Desmond is taken to hospital. The doctor actually described him as being a protoplasmic mass. So his nervous system had, had closed down and he was in a lot of pain and mentally very unstable. The doctors put Desmond in the psychiatric ward. He's there for six months before he's well enough to go home. And she, Yvonne Fletcher, was just devastated when he came home. She'd had enough of him and she wanted to get rid of him. And within days, he began to get violently ill again. One week later, Desmond Butler is dead. The doctors believe he died of natural causes. In those days, the doctors didn't have the knowledge, the background, the skill of what they have today. So that when somebody uh, passed away, the aim was to get rid of it as quickly as you could. Nobody suspects foul play. And Desmond Butler is laid to rest. Yvonne Fletcher is rid of her husband, but she's still not really free. Post-war Sydney was a very difficult place for a woman, someone like Yvonne Fletcher, with two children and no real source of income in a society where women working wasn't seen as being particularly appropriate. Women had good jobs during the war, but that had all changed. After the war, the men come home, women out of the workforce. I mean, this was uncontested really as, as sort of public policy that men should have the jobs back. They should become the breadwinners and women should go back to, uh, back to the kitchen. Yvonne Fletcher doesn't stay single for long. Three years after Desmond Butler's death, she marries her second husband. Louis Fletcher. But Yvonne has a knack for choosing the wrong guy. Louis Fletcher himself was a ladies' man and a, and a heavy drinker and generally regarded as borderline rough cove. Um, there might have been uh, domestic violence in the relationship. Only two months after the wedding, Yvonne is seen around town, badly bruised and she said that he had bashed her. So it was a violent and difficult marriage and she was looking for a way out. If you were a, a housewife in inner Sydney with a basher husband, there was, there was nobody who was really going to speak your mind. That feeling wouldn't have been enunciated on your behalf. You couldn't turn on the radio and hear somebody speak your story. In desperation, Yvonne goes to the police. She wants Bluey evicted from her home. 
Apparently she saw the police quite a few times to report incidents of violence. That didn't seem to lead very far for her. The police say they can't help. There were no guidelines for domestic violence in those days. Our aim was to get rid of the problem as soon as we could. So you might go in and wade into the, uh, uh, the mail and of course take him away and lock him up for drunk. Problem solved. This time, Yvonne Fletcher knows exactly what to do. Louis was looking the same as Des was. They had losing all his weight and plus he had a lot of hair, uh, Louis Fletcher. And you could see that it was thinning out very quickly, you know. A couple of weeks later, Bluey Fletcher calls a neighbour for help. He's crying in pain. The doctors at the hospital can't find anything wrong. They say it's his nerves. The word nerves was, was, a, it was huge. It loomed large. People had nerves. That meant some psychological, psychic, you know, dysfunction of some sort. I mean, nerves are bad. He's got bad nerves. He's a nervy bloke. She's nervy. So it could mean nearly anything, but it generally meant something was not right. We had men coming back from the war with war neuroses, as they called it at that time, so suffering from various mental disorders, and that was all called a nerve disorder. The nerve tonics that were sold at every chemist and advertised widely in the magazines. I think the fact that doctors were perhaps so caught up with this idea of nerves and nervous disorders that they were prepared to overlook some of the physical symptoms like the hair falling out. But Bluey Fletcher thinks something else is going on. He tells his sister that Yvonne is trying to kill him. Two weeks later, Bluey Fletcher is dead. He goes exactly the same way as Yvonne's first husband. This time, it does look suspicious. And so in April 1952, two up and coming detectives, Don Ferguson and Fred Cray, begin to investigate the death of Bluey Fletcher. Fred Cray and Don Ferguson, both hard men, even, you know, in the, by the standards of the Sydney Police Force. Ferguson was the senior man. He was a very uh, self-centred man. He was a very uh, confident man. Fred Cray was one of the smartest men that I've ever known. He had a perfect memory in that you could say something to him and five or 10 minutes or even five or 10 days later, he could repeat that conversation. At that time, they were two outstanding investigators, very tenacious and quite successful. Ferguson and Cray suspect Bluey Fletcher was poisoned, but all the standard tests come up negative. Then, a breakthrough. Right here. A local doctor reminds the detectives of the rat plague. He suggests they test for thallium, the active ingredient in rat poison. Thallium's a metal poison that affects all the organs it comes into contact with. It does accumulate in the body and death results from collapse of one or more of the organs, major organ systems of the body. Thallium poison is banned in the rest of Australia and most of the developed world. But Sydney has endured many outbreaks of bubonic plague, a disease spread by rats. The rat population in Sydney had exploded and they estimate by the 1950s that there are over a million rats in Sydney. The health department wages unceasing war against rats, war by cyanide poison, war by every proven method. But this war cannot be won unless you cooperate. Set breakback traps near rat runs and never forget that the rules of rat warfare are these. Starve them out, 
build them out, kill them off. The most deadly weapon of them all is thallium. And it's not just lethal to rats. When Bluey Fletcher's tests come back from the lab, the results are positive. He has been poisoned with thallium. And it's on every kitchen shelf. As I understand it, it was in three sizes, one ounce, two ounce, and the big three ounce size. And it was available at main department stores, but it was available at corner shops as well. It was marvelously effective on rats, and maybe there was some sort of subliminal unconscious idea that this stuff really gets the job done. And part of what sold thallium to householders in Sydney was that it sort of outfoxed the rats. Rats are cunning and rats can learn very quickly about baits. They associate their illness with the food they've eaten, so they learn not to eat baits. But thallium, because it took that, that little while to work, tricked the rats. So there was this sense that, yeah, this is a wonder. This is a wonder chemical. And of course, the advantage of it was above strychnine and arsenic and other sorts of poisons was that you couldn't smell it, you couldn't see it, and you couldn't taste it. Yvonne Fletcher is now the prime suspect in both her husband's deaths. Ferguson and Cray head straight to Newtown. I, I can remember the police being down at the house. They tried to interview as many of the neighbours as they could to get their story how Des and Bluey Fletcher were. I just knew that they were both looking terrible when they were married to Yvonne and uh, then later on they just passed away, you know. It was a remarkable thing for one husband to die and everybody knew that he would have lost his hair and stuff like that, and then for another one to die of the same, the same way. Now, Ferguson and Cray have enough evidence to exhume the body of Yvonne's first husband, Desmond Butler. Even after three years in the ground, he tests positive for thallium. The police arrest Yvonne Fletcher and charge her with double murder. The news of a woman killing her husband with rat poison captures the public's attention. Women generally don't murder, so the poison, the act of poison, fits into that I guess, stereotype of a woman murderer, that um, she's devious and she's conniving and calculating and plotting. The tabloids recount every detail of the crime, spelling out exact dosages and their effects. Symptoms appeared in the tabloids and also in the Sydney Morning Herald and the respectable papers, and everybody knew what they were. First, of course, there was the tingling and then the loss of hair. Fletcher was paralysed in the legs and his hair had... The effects of thallium usually include blindness and insanity. And it was Yvonne Fletcher's administration of thallium that became the template for later practitioners of the horrible art. In the poor inner city suburb of Redfern, one man reads the newspaper accounts with a special interest. For John Downey, the symptoms being described are very close to home. Downey knows of four people who have already died with symptoms that sound exactly like thallium poisoning. And there's only one woman who could have done it. Just down the road, 63-year-old Caroline Grills lives with her husband. Carolyn Grills was a charming old dear. She was short, she was quite stout, but in a lovely grand maternal way. She was the, I suppose, archetypal grandmother. She cooked cakes and she baked and she liked to sing songs and she was very giving of her time. She'd look after sick people. 
would never come empty-handed, never arrive with arms swinging. There was always something baked or something preserved or jams, gingers, so loved widely. But Caroline Grills is thinking about more than just cakes and jam. She wasn't satisfied with the life that she had. It was very tough in Sydney at that time when you didn't have money and her husband worked in real estate but he wasn't particularly successful and money was tight, things were difficult. So I imagine her as somebody who was au fait with city living but at the same time um, rather aware that getting out to the suburbs would be a nice thing to do. And Caroline Grills is determined to do just that. The first to die is Caroline's 87-year-old stepmother. As Caroline cooks and cares for her, she becomes increasingly ill. Her stepmother's hair falls out. Her legs become paralysed. She dies a slow and painful death. It's all put down to natural causes. Caroline Grills inherits her house. Two months later, Caroline is cooking and caring for another elderly relative. She dies with similar symptoms. And Caroline Grills inherits another house. So she'd gone from being in difficult financial circumstances to being quite wealthy as a result of those deaths. As Caroline keeps on cooking, the people around her keep on dying. Over the next couple of years, another two family members pass away. There's no apparent financial motive. Once she'd killed members of her family and become financially quite well off, it seemed that she was a little less discerning about the people that she began to poison. John Downey is becoming increasingly worried. He remembers Caroline Grill's weekly card parties. Oh, here we go, Mum. Where he, his wife, and his mother-in-law, Evelyn Lundberg, were regular guests. On every visit, Caroline Grill served up a sumptuous array of treats. Oh, yum. It was after one of these parties that Evelyn Lundberg began to get sick. She had the same symptoms described in the newspapers. John Downey believes that his mother-in-law is slowly being poisoned by Caroline Grills. Downey goes straight to the police. He tells Ferguson and Cray about his suspicions. But Detective Ferguson needs evidence. He tells Downey to watch Caroline Grills closely and collect samples of the food she serves. But getting hard evidence won't be as easy as it seems. In September 1952, the murder trial of Yvonne Fletcher hits the headlines. Every sinister detail of the drama is played out daily in the tabloid press. The Yvonne Fletcher murder trial was sensational, was covered, covered particularly by the Sydney tabloids. And a young, you know, reasonably attractive blonde woman, perpetrator, it makes for good press. Yvonne Fletcher pleads not guilty. She denies she's ever bought or handled poison. She tried, I think, to present herself as a good girl and when she went to court of course she presented herself in a very feminine manner. She came in holding her little gilt-edged prayer book. 
The court hears how Bluey Fletcher viciously beat Yvonne. But this generates no sympathy with the all-male jury. So it's extremely difficult for women to mount a case around domestic violence that they believe, it was believed that they were asking for it, that what did they do to provoke it, that it surely wouldn't be the man who would be at fault. One way or another, Detective Ferguson is determined to convict Yvonne Fletcher. He finds witnesses to attack her character. On the day of Bluey Fletcher's funeral, when the hearse drove by, I looked over and saw Dago Joe leaning against the She was the out pole. dancing when they brought him home. She just left him there. No food, Then I noticed no Yvonne food. Fletcher with a grin on her face and she did a little wave to him. Some of it would have been gossip and there was a lot of gossip about Yvonne Fletcher and her sexual morals. You get back to this sort of representation of women's sexuality at that time, being devious and destructive. Assumptions about virtuous wives, you know, that they should be pure and so on. But she had the reputation as being the blonde bombshell on the way to the fiery furnace, basically. She was on the road to hell, one way or another, and this only proved it. The way that she had dealt with both husbands in this callous way only showed that women of that sort would behave in that way. Read all about it, read all about it. Yvonne Fletcher has already been convicted in the press. Read all about it, tortured by tempers. She showed no mercy. Now, the public awaits the court's verdict. All rise. After a seven-day trial, the jury returns with their verdict. Guilty, Your Honour. On September 23rd, 1952, the judge delivers the sentence. The crime of murder is a terrible one. And when the killing is by means of an insidious poison secretly administered within the family circle to an unsuspecting victim, then the crime is a horrible one. The sentence of this court is that you, Yvonne Gladys Fletcher, be taken to the place of execution and be hanged by the neck until you are dead. Fletcher's sentencing sparks a new wave of media hysteria. There are calls for the banning of thallium, but they fall on deaf ears. Meanwhile, Caroline Grills remains under suspicion. She continues to host her tea parties. And John Downey continues to collect food samples from her table but they all test negative for thallium. Detective Ferguson tells Downey not to give up. Cray and Ferguson were convinced that, that Grills had in fact killed those four people and attempted to kill others. But it was a weird one, it was a hard story to sell. There was no conflict between her and the victims, quite the reverse, she'd been cheerfully uh, caring towards them. So John Downey keeps watching. Then, one day he notices something suspicious. Talk it up here, man. He takes the suspect T straight to the police.
it tests positive for thallium. Ferguson and Cray now have enough evidence to exhume the bodies of Caroline Grill's suspected victims. Two have been cremated, but two test positive for thallium. The detective's suspicions are confirmed. Caroline Grills is a serial killer. Caroline Grills became one of those cases that you'd never forget amongst the, the hundreds of other murders which we investigated over a 25 year time because it was such an insidious thing that she did to her own relatives, to her own friends, and in such a way that what was she getting out of it? On May 11, 1953, detectives Ferguson and Cray arrest Caroline Grills for four murders and three attempted murders. News of Caroline Grills' arrest fuels the public's fascination with thallium poisoning and inspires some people to try it for themselves. A wave of copycat crimes explode across the city. Ten people have died and 36 others have been admitted to hospital in New South Wales as a result of thallium poisoning since March 1952. It seems to have just hit some weird readiness in the populace of Sydney, some weird sort of raw nerve. The number of thallium poisonings just went through the roof. We began to see thallium used as a, a weapon against other people and also used in suicides. So there were more stories of women using it in, you know, putting it in their husband's tea. There was a case in Leichhardt where a woman was preparing dinner and the old man came home drunk and went for her with a carving knife. Round the corner she went to the corner store and bought a little one ounce bottle of Thelrat, put it in his tea. You know, a truck driver in a kind of row with another bloke over the affections of a lass leaves an open bottle of beer and the seat beside him in the truck has thallium in it. Or in the case of Ruby Norton, she was using thallium through her famous bacon and egg pies. When something is reported in the newspaper, you do see this flow on effect and other people read about it and think, oh, that's a good idea. There are so many cases that sometimes the Herald was running three a day with very little detail of what or who was involved because the cops basically couldn't keep track of everything that was going on. People were putting it in soft drinks, a jilted boyfriend tells his girlfriend, my heart's broken, I'm going to drink thallium. She says, oh, I don't, but he does. But that was the general availability of it, that you could buy it on a whim and use it on a whim. One case would shock 1950s society and force the city to confront the thallium craze. The poisoning of rugby league star Bobby Lullum. Lullum has played for Australia and is a record-breaking try scorer for Balmain. Very popular in, in, uh, as far as the Balmain supporters were. And when he played for Australia, he was terrific. And he was just a nice fellow. He'd come and have a beer with us, talk with us, have a joke and everything, and um, just go about his business of working. The police are tipped off by an anonymous phone call from a mysterious woman. My husband is trying to poison Bobby Lullum, the footballer. He put thallium in his glass of beer while they were in a hotel. When the police rush to Lullum's house, they find him suffering from poisoning symptoms. They send him straight to hospital. He had what the team doctor thought was a stomach ulcer, but in fact he was having nervous disorders. His hands and feet were showing signs of pins and needles, lack of feeling, and eventually his hair fell out. The police have no idea why Bobby Lulham is being poisoned or who the mystery woman is. Then they receive another clue, a letter made of newspaper clippings. Detectives are sent to Lullum's house to investigate. They find his mother-in-law, 45-year-old Veronica Monty, living there. Monty explains that her marriage has recently broken up 
and she's moved in with her daughter and son-in-law, Judith and Bobby Lalam. Under questioning, Veronica Monti confesses to making the anonymous phone call and sending the letter. But that's not all she admits to. I don't know what subconscious urge made me buy thallium. I was in Knock and Kirby's store looking at plants and I found myself face to face with the dreadful stuff. It was standing on the counter and I bought it. At no time had thallium ever been discussed in our household. I dare say I had read about it. I reached for the thallium one night as I sat alone in the kitchen. I had decided to take the poison myself in a cup of Milo. Judy and Bobby were in bed. It was a cold night and when they heard me moving about, they asked if they could have a hot drink also. My haphazard thinking must have caused me to get the cups mixed up. Monty claims she intended to drink the poisoned Milo herself. The cops don't buy it. They charge her with attempted murder. Subsequently, she did in fact take Thelrat in order to, as it were, in retrospect, prove the suicide intent theory. And she ended up in hospital as well with thallium symptoms at the same time as Bobby Lullum. As the tabloid coverage of Bobby Lullum's poisoning heats up, the trial of Caroline Grills begins. Record crowds packed the public gallery to observe her bizarre courtroom behaviour. She was laughing, smiling, and really not behaving appropriately for someone who was in court facing such serious charges. Mr Grills, F.W. Grills, Mrs Grills' husband, always used to say, Carrie doesn't know what she's done here. At one stage, she came out of court, stood on the steps of the courthouse where there was an assembled media throng and said an extraordinary thing. She said, it's the fun of the world. Oh, it's the fun of the world. Caroline Grills is on trial for the attempted murder of Evelyn Lundberg. Evidence is also emerging about her other attempts to kill. One interesting murder that she attempted was the one on the Downies, where she presented them with a jar of preserved ginger, which was a rarity, a, a, a delicacy in the 1950s. And she knew that they were aware of what she was up to by now, so she knew she'd have to go the extra step to make sure that they consumed something that she'd given them. So she had to make it something special. And the jar of ginger sat on the mantelpiece for a long time until Mr Downey couldn't bear it anymore and he had a piece and then the next day he had another piece and then he felt tingling in his limbs and his hair started to fall out. But she knew what she was doing with food. It was that kind of temptation of a sweet at that time when I suppose treats and special foods were quite rare and difficult to get. So they see this, this um, suspect jar of ginger and even though they know that it possibly could poison them, they eat it anyway. Caroline Grills pleads not guilty. Her lawyer argues there's no motive. To try to convince a jury in a court that she was in fact a vicious multiple murderer it just it was more than counterintuitive. It just didn't seem to make any sense at all. However, the scientific evidence was so strong. It was extremely strong. She was perhaps the only person who had the opportunity to poison this range of people. The forensic evidence of thallium in Evelyn Lundberg's cup of tea and traces of thallium found in the pocket of Caroline Grill's dress seal her fate. I think that's what horrified society most about these poisons, the fact that it wasn't dry toast, it was food that was made with love, that was a treat, that was something that was special. 
and that that was the vehicle that was used to poison people. There was something about that and about a woman's role as a nurturer and a carer that um, I think people found particularly difficult to understand. The jury take only 12 minutes to return with a verdict. Guilty. Caroline Grills is sentenced to death. Later on, people realised that she was stark raving mad and the good cheer was a sign of her utter looniness. She was a mad killer. It's the fun of the world! Detectives Ferguson and Cray become the police force's leading poison experts. Their careers are on the rise. I think they were both very well regarded by the media and they would be prepared to talk openly to the reporters and they became celebrities as far as the readers of the newspapers were concerned. The public craves every detail of the upcoming Veronica Monti trial. The tabloid press is more than happy to oblige. The Monti case was one of the great coverages by Truth. You could buy Truth on a Sunday after Mass, and you could go home and you know go to have a beer and a, and a roast and go to sleep with it over your face in the afternoon. But. Truth coverage was always guaranteed to be very detailed and highly suggestive, and it was made for Mrs Monty and Mrs Monty was made for it. Veronica Monty is on trial for the attempted murder of her son-in-law, the famous footballer Bobby Lullum. On the witness stand, Lullum is questioned about his relationship with his mother-in-law. He tells the court about the night Veronica Monti came home while his wife slept. Judith had already gone to bed and I was in the lounge room listening to the broadcast. 48 for four, Australia. The winning or losing of this match can be in the balance now. I kissed my mother-in-law goodnight and said I was going to bed. She insisted that I stay there and talk to her and listen to the cricket. both more or less stretched onto the lounge and, and got comfortable. Then after several kisses, we became a little familiar with one another. There was no intercourse or anything like that. Did anything happen to any clothing? I think Mrs. Monty's slacks were lowered and around her knees. To put it briefly, did you satisfy your sexual desires? Yes. <laughs> oh, it's you know, about Bobby Lullum, he's with his mother-in-law, you know? Oh, fair nigga, oh yeah. Oh boy, you know, good luck to him. Oh. <laughs> The tabloids went into a frenzy. There were headlines petting in the parlour and a lot of focus on his sexual misdemeanours and in particular a lot of judgement of Mrs Monty. I mean, it's a pretty shocking case and would have shocked 50s society absolutely of this woman doing what she did. She has this relationship and then probably is shocked and disgusted at what she's done and feels the only way out is to get rid of him. And the combination of her homicidal tendencies with her sexual adventuring was a potent thing for the public. 
especially in 1953. Veronica Monti and Bobby Lullum have sex two more times. His wife used to go to church, and uh, uh, when she went to church, they would uh, meet one another. He paints her as this predator, and he, as Australian representative footballer, was physically somehow under her spell, and he couldn't resist this middle-aged woman. He had to succumb to acts of intimacy, that she had some kind of strange sexual power almost over him and he could stand up in court and say, well, no, I wasn't the instigator. She was the instigator. She grabbed me by the wrist and pulled me down. It's almost as though he's saying, I wasn't really responsible. I, I couldn't help myself. It, it's not my fault. Throughout the trial, Veronica Monti is held in the remand section of Long Bay Prison. She tells a Truth newspaper reporter about her experiences. I was given a prison nightdress, which did nothing for my morale. And I was taken to a dormitory in what I discovered to be the remand section. A wardress introduced me to the women in the section by their first names only. I met Caroline, a gentle, motherly type of person, and Yvonne. I then learned the identity of Yvonne. She was Yvonne Fletcher. Caroline Grills and Yvonne Fletcher are both being held in remand while they appeal their death sentences. You could typify Yvonne Fletcher as being a floozy and Mrs Grills as being slightly deranged. It wasn't the case with Mrs Monty, who looked as if she was an upstanding pillar of the society. Certainly no one would suspect her either of madness or of um, flirtatiousness, but yet she had involved not only her son-in-law in a sexual affair, but also brought Thallium into it when things went, went wrong. Bobby Lullum's evidence plays a crucial role in the outcome of the trial. Bobby Lullum, acutely embarrassed and beyond embarrassed, shamed, did actually leave it out there and said it was possible that she had intended the poison Milo for herself and it was possible and that he accepted that he may have accidentally drunk it. So he could have really convicted her there or, or not. He, he chose to give evidence that gave the jury an out. And so Veronica Monti is acquitted. After all the publicity and scandal, the public and the authorities have finally had enough. In November 1953, thallium is banned in New South Wales. The madness comes to an end. But nobody will ever really know the final death toll. Fletcher was the first one to be arrested, but I guarantee she wasn't the first one to um, use it for homicidal purposes. There were others, and there were others which we thought at the time, where we went down to the, uh, uh, to the records and looked at uh, suspicious deaths, and there's not much doubt that there were others. But the whole thing was they were cremated. As Australia moves into the more hopeful and prosperous era of the late 1950s, the disturbing events of the dark post-war period are left unexplained. There's so much that's strange, you know, and, and, and kind of impossible to understand about the thallium period in Sydney history. Uh, maybe there's a kind of war trauma at large that's diffused through the whole culture, a great deal of confusion, uh, unsureness as to what's expected of people. There's not much guidance to people as to what they should do. For all the representation of the 1950s that we've, we've known, i.e. it was a period of great tranquility and harmony and happy consumerism. Beneath that was quite a pressure cooker of tensions and anxieties and concerns simmering beneath that facade of the 1950s housewife. The difference between what people had and what they saw on the, the silver screen or in magazines did prompt some of those women to look afield, you know, try to give themselves a better life. 
So it was an unusual phase in Australian history where we had a group of women, particularly someone like Caroline Grills, who killed many people. That's not something that you would see often in criminal history of Australia. Yvonne Fletcher's death sentence is commuted to life. She's released in 1965 and dies of old age in 2009. Caroline Grill's death sentence is also commuted to life. In 1960, she dies in Long Bay Jail, where she's known as Aunt Thally. Veronica Monti commits suicide in a hotel room in 1955. Bobby Lullum never plays football again. After divorcing his wife, Judith, he moves away from Sydney for good. The Thallium cases launch the careers of detectives Ferguson and Cray. They go on to become two of the most corrupt cops in New South Wales. And as Sydney moves on, it leaves behind the ingredients that created a recipe for murder. Next on ABC, get up to the minute coverage of Australian and international news on Late Line, or head to iView and take an in-depth look at one of the most high-profile murder trials of all time, OJ Simpson caught on camera.